Welcome to Fun with Annuities with your host, me, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent. Can annuities be fun? Can contractual guarantees be fun? Absolutely they can. Find out the brutal facts about annuities with no sales pitches or high pressure nonsense. Just the brutal and factual annuity truth, which is all you need to hear. Let's have some fun with annuities and let's have that fun start right now. Welcome to Fun with Annuities. I'm your host, Stan, the Annuity Man, where our saying here is live in the reality, not the dream. And today is kind of a dream because we have Bob Powell on the program. He's a very good friend of mine. Both of us, a long time ago, used to work for Dean Witter Reynolds, if you remember that, but he's a very smart person. He's no longer doing that. But you know what he is doing? He's advising retirees on, and, and people that are investors, both retirees and investors, on you know, the markets and what they need to be aware of. Very smart guy. Let me go through some of his, not all of his stuff that uh, he's achieved, but some of it. Um, you know, he, He's a, an award-winning financial journalist. He's appeared in the USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, Market Watch. Um, he's still writing for Market Watch, ARP. He uh, appears regularly on thestreet.com. Um, in fact, he's the editor and publisher of The Street's Retirement Daily. He started with ba the Boston Herald. If, if you're up there, you know who that is. And he's also a credentialed uh, CFP, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, like I said, before he was, uh, became a financial journalist and one of the top in the country. By the way, you know, if you, you've probably read a lot of his stuff in the USA Today. Every time I'm looking at the USA Today, he seems to be there. Um, but he's done a lot. He's he serves as the editor-in-chief of the Investments and Wealth Institute's Retirement Management Journal. He's the host of IWI's Exceptional Advisor podcast. Um, he does a lot of stuff. He's the co-founder of a company called Finstream.tv. He's an instructor at Salem State University's online elder planning specialist program. A lot. Does a lot. Um, he graduated with a bachelor's degree in English literature from Marquette University. Go Warriors! and a master's degree in journalism from Boston University College of Communication School of Management. He lives in Swampscott, Massachusetts, <laughs> with his wife, has four children, triplet sons, and a daughter. So, you know, he can, when you have triplet sons, you can manage a lot. So Bob can manage a lot. So welcome to Fun with Annuities, Bob Powell. How are you? I'm great, Stan. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and I'm glad you didn't go through each and every line of the long bio, but you really did get the highlights. It would be, we'd be here all day, Bob. You've done a lot. I mean, I didn't even mention all the boards you're on. If there's a, if there's a board in Swampscott, Bob's on it. So if you're, if you're moving to Swampscott, you might want to check in with Bob. So let's jump in, Bob Powell, because of all the people that I know, you probably have your finger on the pulse better than anyone of of today's retirees and investors, the readers out there, because you interact with them um, and you're very accessible to your readers. And once again, we're gonna have all your, your stuff on our site so people can go there. My, my um, people listen on the podcast and also viewing this on my YouTube channel. Let's talk about current markets at the time of this taping, Bob. What, what are your feelings about kind of where we're at with the markets and what are the re readers worried about or asking? Yeah, so um, I think the big thing is, in, is inflation real now? For many years, right, we've had to worry about how do you find uh, yield in a zero interest rate environment? And if inflation is rising, I guess there's, it's, a, it's a betwixt between problem, right? On the one hand, right. uh, folks are, are grappling for higher yields and that may result from higher inflation. On the other hand, they've benefited from low inflation because their cost of living has been relatively low. Mm -hmm. So if inflation rises, their cost of living is going to go up. And uh, so I think, you know, as much as you uh, yearn for a higher yield, you may regret the fact that you'll be paying perhaps higher gasoline prices or higher food prices or higher lumber prices, whatever it might be. So I think, you know, be careful of what you wish for. Uh, so, but the, the real problem is, is this, is this period of inflation real or is it transitory as, uh, Chairman Powell, no relation, said. Um, <laughs> Are you sure about that, Bob? Come on. 
no, no fourth cousin in Ancestry.com that I know of. No relation. <laughs> but I have no special insight other than what he said, uh, you know, before Congress, which is, right. you know, I think that, you know, we do have this unique problem right now is we're coming out of COVID where demand was low and now it's rising and supply is low and it has to catch up. So I think there will be some things where inflation uh, is more permanent than in other places. Um, but we don't know yet, right? So you have to sort of navigate these waters. And I would say the big problem for investors, whether you're saving for or living in retirement, is that you've been reaching for yield, right? Money market funds pay next to nothing, and they, spend, and they pay actually negative if you look at it as a real return, right? If you look at sure. inflation minus a nominal return, you're actually earning below. Your, it's a negative return. And the same is true with the short-term CD. So people have been reaching for yields. They've been going after... MLPs or REITs or, uh, you know, BDCs or, you know, name the flavor of the month where you can get five or six or 7%. But, but what you're also getting is a lot more risk by going out and venturing into these, you know, non-traditional investments. And that's where I think for me, that's where people are concerned about in terms of what do I do with my money? How do I earn a higher return? But how do I make sure that I'm not, uh, you know, risking principal? And isn't that an age-old question going back to when you and I started at Dean Witter, right? Yeah. People always come in. <laughs> Years ago, I don't know. I don't. I think we talked about this. You know, I had I cut my teeth, you know, one day a week in the Sears store, right yeah. next to Caldwell Socks Banker and Stocks, and, man. And remember that? Right. <laughs> socks and Socks, right? And I remember people would come in, novice investors, and say. I want something that generates a high return, but doesn't put my money at risk. So going back 34 years, the same goals, you know, back then are the same goals that people have now. Unfortunately, you just described the false and misleading index annuity pitch, which is market <laughs> upside with no downside, which is, is, you know, every day I'm hammering away that, no, 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 these are CD type products. These are not market products. But, um, you know, I, I agree. Everyone's looking for the perfect product. Everyone's looking for the too good to be true product. And if you talk to enough people, they'll sell it to you. Um, you just have to be very careful. Now, you're, do you get a lot of questions about interest rates and where they're going? Because for the last six years, Bob, I've heard the following. Hey, Stan, the annuity man, America's annuity agent, interest rates have to go up, right? No, they've gone down for the last six years. What are you, what are you hearing and what's your kind of thought and opinion on interest rates, not, and nobody knows where they're going, but I'd love to hear what your insight is on this. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I sometimes take a look at the, you know, the Federal Reserve from in St. Louis has the, uh, right, the 10-year break-even rate, and I mm -hmm. think that's as good a place to start as any, right? Right okay. now, it's about 2.4%. So it's suggesting that, you know, long-term rates um, are, uh, you know, not going to be much higher uh, than they are. So I think people have to sort of use that as your benchmark and say, I'm not going to go too far out. I mean, at the moment right now, the day that we're recording this, we're watching the yield curve flatten out quite a bit. So right. right, short rates are rising, but long rates are sort of holding steady. So that's sort of an indication that inflation is not really, you know, a, a, a long term event at the moment. Now, I wouldn't necessarily be buying long bonds, for, you know, on the odd chance that, you know, interest rates sure. do continue to rise. But I'd say this is a good, as good an indication as any as whether, you know, where you should be thinking about putting your money. Um, if you're, you know, and, and I just got off a call, it's just to stand with a, a good many, a dozen investment professionals, all of whom were talking about why would anyone invest in fixed income at the moment? It provides no yield on the short term. It provides no yield in the intermediate term and no yield sure. in the long term. And so these folks, you know, a dozen investment professionals, some of them with the largest, you know, financial institutions in the, in the country, in the world, are grappling with where do you put money if not in fixed income at the moment? And that's, I think that's a really interesting, you know, question that folks, average folks have to deal with as well as institutional investors. I agree with that. I mean, one of the, one of the, there's many types of annuities. So I always laugh and me and you have joked about this, that I hate all annuities. It's like saying I hate all restaurants. There's many types, but one of the types that's really popular right now with us is these multi-year guarantee annuities, which are fixed rate annuities that right now you can get a five-year piece of paper that's yielding 3% annually. That sounds horrific when you think back to Jimmy Carter, but right now that's not bad because of the dynamic pricing model of life insurance companies. They can back up that 3% yield. Yeah, but, but I understand having been, and you and I both been on that side of the table as financial advisors, masters of the universe, that we're trying to figure out how to, you know, does it make sense to lock in a 3%? I mean, that's, I don't know, but what I have, and I think you're dealing with this as well. There's 10,000 baby boomers hitting age 65 every single day. That's a demographic tidal wave in my book, and I'm sure yours as well. 
Um, do you think that this interest rate range that we're in, is this the new normal? Um, I think it's the new normal for at least the next, um, let's call it five years. Okay. Right. And I think, you know, that's as good as a horizon as any. I think if, a, you know, if I'm talking to a retiree who's, who is now retired and worried about how am I going to generate income, you know, I've, I've become increasingly fond, Stan, of the bucket strategy or time mm -hmm. segmentation. Yep. Where you say, let's, and, and forget for the moment, right, 4% rule, right? Everyone loves to talk about the 4%. Yeah, please, rule. Let's, let's get rid of that. <laughs> let's get rid of the 4% rule. Right. So let's take, for example, you say, okay, let's use the bucket strategy. And I'm going to put, you know, one to five years of my living expenses in something that is safe, might be low yielding, but it's not going to be at risk. And then I'm going to put the next five to 10 years of my living expenses in another tranche. Maybe it's a balanced fund. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's something that you have an idea on what to use. Uh, and then, you know, your 10 plus, year, 10 plus year money is going into something perhaps a little bit riskier. And then as you go through retirement, as you're going through, right, the belly of the snake, well, each year you're peeling off a, a year from the, from the other bucket and bringing it in forward to the next bucket. That way, you really don't have to worry about a couple things. One, what the market is doing day to day, right? Because your living expenses are taken care of for the next five years. And then secondly, you don't have to worry about the 4% rule because you're, you're not pulling from your portfolio per se, right? You've already, you've already pulled from it. And actually, you've pulled more than 4%, right? You've liquidated a year's worth of investments to fund year five, let's say. So I've become increasingly fond of this strategy because I think it, it does, it takes a lot of the worry out of what the market is doing and where you're gonna find yield, right? If, you, if you're thinking about, well, I, I need yield today, well, you should take that off the table, right? And say, what I'm producing today funds my living expenses. And then years five through 10, well, it's in a balanced fund. So it's gonna be more at risk, but it's gonna be perhaps diversified to the point where it gives you a lot better yield than maybe say three or 4%. And, and maybe the upside potential for 10. You know, I, I'd be curious, Stan, because you know, I have gotten lots of questions about um, a new, relatively new product called Rylas. And mm -hmm. people are looking at these as, well, having my cake and eat it too. Um, mm. And you know, in terms of it being a five to 10 year or 10 year plus investment, you know, is that something that, uh, you know, I'm going to throw it back to you. Is that an option? Well, you know, it's a, red, it's a registered product, so I'm not, uh, I'm not at liberty to comment on it, and I don't want to comment on it in the podcast. We can certainly get that information to people they want to contact us. But, but in a low, I'll answer it like this. Anytime there's a low interest rate environment like we are in and we have been in, that's when um, brokerage firms and life insurance companies start getting creative and creating products out of midair that sound too good to be true and typically contractually are not once you look under the hood. What I would tell people is just be very, very careful on your hopes and dreams because you're going to own contractual realities. Before we uh, go to the, before I wanted to get people to, uh, which site do they go to, Bob? Is it retirementweekly.com? What do you want them to go to? to yeah, so they can go to retirementdaily.net. That's where they'll find Retirement Daily. Re retirementdaily.net. Um, one correct. word, all under retirementdaily.net. Okay, and what, right. what do so, they find there, Bob? So what they'll find there is uh, each and every day we're publishing two to three articles, some written by me, some written by uh, financial professionals. Okay. Um, they'll find uh, three times a week. What I do is a Q&A with Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham Wealth Partners. Sure. Is famous as the chief planning officer at Kitsis.com and work, does some work for Horse's Mouth. So he and I, we take reader questions and, and we answer them three times a week. Um, I'm also answering reader questions on my own twice a week. And, um, and what mm -hmm. you'll find is a diversity. I, what I like to say is that you'll find content that you might not find in other sites. So some of the financial professionals that we have writing for us are, are writing um, things that are of substance. Um, they're really challenging readers. And I like to think that each day we're raising the bar in terms of the kind of content that we're uh, publishing from financial advisors. There's a, a good many folks out there who, you know, are offering unique perspectives, not sure. just, you know, set aside 10% of your money each year for retirement or don't, or don't buy, you know, don't buy this. It's, it's really, my hope is to sort of say, let's, for if you're a student of retirement, we have something for you there. And, uh, and so retirementdaily.net, is there a cost of that, Bob, or? No, so, well, there's, there's, um, there's, there's uh, in, front of the, in front of the paywall, the content is free. Got um, it. There are a couple articles that we publish behind the paywall, and I would okay. describe those as more personalized. So, for instance, if people are asking us questions they, they want answers to, that we put that behind the paywall, and it's more technical, it's more personalized, it's more concierge-like service. 
So that, that content is behind the paywall, but not a lot of it. I'd say for every 10 articles we publish, maybe two are behind the paywall. Got it. And so the stuff you're doing for the street.com is separate, correct? It's, uh, yeah, so it's separate. So we, the Retirement Daily uh, actually operates as a business within the street. Got it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're fortunate enough to be housed inside their website, which is great. And then I'm also writing for the street's flagship, uh, where you can find my articles in both two places. One is in the retirement section, and which is, which is free. And then also in the Financial Advisor Center, where I'm writing articles Good. for the benefit of FAs. Then you can find me on Market Watch. Just uh, you know, search my name in the search box. Sure. Uh, same for USA Today, and uh, and you know I'm writing once a week for Market Watch and twice a month for USA Today. Now. And the, and the risk to Bob is carpal tunnel syndrome, and we're not we're not uh, <laughs> downplaying that at all. But man, does do you do a lot of content? You are a content monster for sure. Well, um, you know, I'm never at a risk. There's no shortage of articles to write, Stan. Yeah, Every day there's yeah. a new product, new research, new law, new something. And so I, 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 for me, it's always a question of what should I write about given all that I could write about. Which leads, I mean, you dovetailed into something that I wanted to get your opinion on anyway, crypto. Yeah. You know, obviously this is, uh, you know, me and you have been around a long time. And we, you know, we remember the dot-com era. We remember those IPOs back in the day. We remember all of that. We remember when, you know, there was uh, uh, no, the person from IBM historically said he didn't see a need for anyone to have a com you know, computer in their home. Um, now here comes crypto, which for old codgers like me and you, we, we look at it sideways because we've seen so much, yeah. you know, and we've seen, we understand the tulip bulb bubble back in the day. Yeah. What's your opinion on this? long term and maybe you have some personal insights on just what's happening with cryptocurrency well isn't it the most crazy thing that i've ever seen <laughs> yes right I, yes. I it's a head scratcher um there's nothing behind it really uh, you know so and i and i worry about it but on the other hand it's interesting the financial planning association just released a survey about investment trends for fas and I'm, I'm going to misquote the actual numbers, but I'll get the direction right. Ballpark, is, yeah. Yeah, ballpark. You know, maybe a year ago, 3% of advisors said that they were going thinking about adding crypto to their clients' portfolios. Well, that number has risen dramatically this yeah. year. More and more advisors are thinking about adding uh, crypto to their clients' portfolios. Not in large amounts, right? Maybe some small exposure, 3 4 5% of the portfolio going to crypto. And I think the, the, the problem, as I see it, is they're... they're, they're, they're we have no sense of whether this is a correlated asset to anything or uncorrelated to anything, right? right? There's just no history around its correlation. So we don't know if it's adding in terms of, you know, risk adjusted returns. Um, nor do we know how it performs in different kinds of environments. I, I just read a paper that looked at, you know, the best investments for inflationary times. And the author, uh, a professor out of Duke University said, uh, Crypto might be an interesting inflation hedge, but it's never experienced an inflationary period. <laughs> so we have no idea, right? What we do right. know is it's volatile as all, as all heck, yeah. right? Up, yeah. right? Up 50, down 50, and, and then yeah. back up again 50. Um, so, uh, you know, I, so I, I'm, I'm going to fall in the camp that says I'm dabbling in it personally, right? Not a lot. I just want to see how it performs, right? The other thing about crypto is there's Bitcoin, there's ETH. There's light. There's, you know, True Badger just there's got hundreds, announced. There's, there's hundreds. thousands of them. Yeah, there's thousands. Yeah, you're there's right. There's thousands of tokens out there. So which one is going to survive? We don't know yet, right? That's another bet, right? Do you want to do you want to bet on the one that doesn't survive, or are you going to bet on the one that does survive? And then, you know, ultimately, we're looking at things like China is putting a clamp down on right. crypto. That was a right? wake up and, call. Yeah, absolutely. Right? It's a big wake up call. And I think one of the things that people have told me is. Well, China's putting a clamp down on Bitcoin because they want to launch their own crypto, right? They want to create their own fiat currency that's digital. So that's why they're putting a clamp down on all these other, you know, non, uh, you know, fiat currencies that are coming out of, right? The bulk of crypto, uh, the bulk of Bitcoin is coming out of China. Right. right? And, right. Uh, and, and so, you know, they don't want that. Right? They want their own currency. I, I think, you know, personally, what I would say is, if you have risk assets, right? If you have mad money, money that you can afford to lose, maybe it's worth dabbling in. Um, I, I don't know if I would buy the actual token themselves versus maybe 
um, you know, there's a couple ETFs that sure. are out there, you know, spread your risk among many different tokens. That way you don't have to sort of, you know, be, be such a, put all that money at risk in, on the one token that may or may not survive. I think that that would be foolish. This is a, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? If we go back to the internet days, we didn't know that Correct. Netscape, right? Would Netscape survive, right? I mean, that's just the name in the dustbin now. Sure. Right? Well, it's kind of um, like cars. When cars first came out, there was hundreds of manufacturers. When computers first came out for in-home use, there were hundreds of manufacturers and only a few survivors. To me, being an old um, financial advisor, as we were, Bob, yeah. it reminds me of when we used to put 2 and 3% of a person's portfolio in managed futures. Remember that? <laughs> I mean, you know, they come in and say, well, you know, always have the exposure to managed futures, but you want, you know, you want the, what's the guy's name, John Paul Henry or whoever, you want those guys managing it, but two to 3%, it feels like that to me. And as, as I've said on other, other podcasts, I do, you know, blockchain's here to stay. That's not going anywhere. So I think that's the key thing, right? Yeah. Is, is blockchain is real. I yes. think that's real, right? Yeah. Whether, yeah. So. <laughs> but crypto, you know, people say, well, is Bitcoin going to be around? Is Dogecoin going to be around? And, and my, my answer is, boy, I don't know. Um, you know this, if, if, and I've said this before, and people have yelled at me because of it. If the government came out with the five uh, or six heads of the largest banks standing behind them and said, you know what, we've come up with Patriot coin or, or US coin or whatever, and that's the one we're going to recognize. Yeah. All the rest, we really appreciate you playing, but we're not going to recognize it. If they did that, which I could see them doing just from the standpoint of control and also taxation, then it's game over for all these other thousands yeah. that have popped up. Um, but it's interesting to see, and it's a great reflection of, of just the entrepreneurism that's inherent with people to, you know, to gravitate toward this. And I think it's also a statement against government itself that they don't want it to be controlled. So yeah. it's, a, it's a neat little social experiment. The problem with social experiments, Bob, as you know, people tend to lose a lot of money because the leverage that I'm reading that people are, people are leveraging the purchase of Bitcoin while, per, while leveraging crypto. I mean, yeah. just some of the leverages is 10 to one and I've seen a hundred to one. You and yeah. I both know leverage, leverage at the end of the day doesn't work. No, it's bad. You know, it's interesting, Sam, and, I, and I'll throw this out to you. I'm curious for your reaction too. We look at companies like Mass Mutual or New York Life putting some money into crypto, and then you look at someone like Jamie Dimon saying, no thanks, you know, <laughs> that, uh, right? So, yeah. you know, I mean, we're looking at the institutional world, some of them saying, yes, it's real, and some saying, mm, not so much, right? Well, it, it, I mean, that's a great example of like some advisors are recommended and some advisors don't. Some company you know, um, C, uh, CFOs want it and some CFOs don't want it. Uh, yeah. The problem I think with it is uh, a lot of the advisory group and age that's, that's out there advising right now, I've never seen a down market. Me and you have cowboy boots older than yeah. these people. And until you've been through some cycles, what we, me and you call cycles, where markets literally go down and people get hurt. Um, and it's amazing how the 2008 debacle has kind of been wiped clean of people's memories. Right. Um, you know, there's going to have to be that pain again for people to realize it, but then they'll forget it again and something new will happen. But um, I think crypto um, is, is the wave of the future. I just don't know who the winner is. Like you said, I don't think the people that it wouldn't surprise me that the top five cryptos now will not be around or will not be, or will be lessened severely if something happens. It's just hard for me to believe our government or other governments aren't going to have their hands in it. Yeah, My opinion. you know, you, know what, you, you talk about the ingenuity and entrepreneurship. I've also been amazed, right? We saw the the the, the SPAC revolution take hold sure. this year, right? And explain and, that to uh, our listeners and viewers. Explain yeah, so that. a special purpose acquisition um, company is a you know a company that would uh, in essence raise money, have no operating company behind it, and then go buy a private company to take over. And, uh, and, and, and what happened was it seemed good on paper, right? These, you're going to invest in a company that's going to go buy companies, right. but it turned out to be a, a bit of a mirage because one valuation started rising on the companies that they were buying. And more often than not, the people who sort of created the SPAC made the money, but not the average investor who was buying into the SPAC. 
So we, I've written one of the very first articles I wrote for MarketWatch this year was, if you have designs on adding a SPAC to your portfolio, run the other way. You know, this is not <laughs> anything that, it, you know, not, unless you were the managing partner of the, of the company creating the SPAC, you're going to be on the losing end of this. And, you know, and that proved to be true. Many SPACs, you know, didn't turn well, out to be money in making investments. I'm glad you brought that up because under the category, there's nothing new in this world. Back in the day when we were with Dean Witter, um, there were things called holding companies. They weren't called SPACs, they were called holding companies. And they did the exact same thing. We're a holding company. We want you to invest in our stock. And you're like, well, what do you do? Well, we haven't figured that out yet, but when we do it, it's gonna be good. And it was called a holding company back then. And a lot of the uh, penny stock brokers back in the day, people don't know what those are, look that up. That's a whole nother Bob <laughs> and I conversation. But a lot of the penny stocks were sold under the guise of a holding company. Yeah. And so when I saw these SPACs come out, I'm like, holy crap, they just, they just put lipstick on the pig. Man, <laughs> this is fantastic. Right. But it falls under also the category, which, which the annuities lead the way on this. If it sounds too good to be true, it is every single time, no exceptions. Yeah. And that includes Bitcoin as well. I do worry about people putting way too much money in or people that you know, are, are leveraging themselves. And when it does hiccup and when it does go down, and it will, yeah. um, it's going to be ugly. And I, and I, I feel for those people to a point, but they, sh they should kind of know better. Am I right about that, Bob? Yeah. You know, I mean, like, you know, that old saying, right, you should invest your time before you invest your money. And I think that's sure. true, you know, as it was back when we started in the business as it is today. And, sure. and what I see is a lot of times, you know, thanks perhaps to Robin Hood and, and uh, you know, and maybe others of that ilk, you know, people aren't investing their time, right? They're, they're investing their time reading Reddit or, you know, and whatnot. And, and then following the crowd and, you know, and then finding out that the crowd isn't always right, right? And I think, you know, so we, we've got an interesting period in our life where we're, the information is flowing. It might not be the right information, but, you know, and, and people may not be reading all of the information, right? I mean, I, I think that's right. true of facts. It's true of annuities. Sure. Um, it's probably true of, you know, life insurance policies, right? I mean, I, I, I uh, at each and every turn, I'd learned something new that I didn't know the day before. I, someone was explaining to me whether, you know, the, uh, the conditions on, under which you might be able to access the cash value in your life insurance pol policy. Sure. And, and how you may not think, it may not be there for you when the time comes, and, right? And by the way, the sales pitch on that, on that sales pitch is tax-free income. By the way, it's not tax-free income. It's called a loan. <laughs> and all <laughs> loans are tax-free. That's a great, that's financial semantics, word games. Um, but yeah, if you think you bought a whole life or whatever policy and you go, I got this tax-free income. No, you're taking a loan out. You're paying a percentage. And you're paying it back and it's right. Yeah, yeah don't let people, don't, don't let advisors get away with that. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunately, um, and I'll ask you this question, you know, there's a lot of talk about fiduciary. In my opinion about fiduciary, it should be, it should be inherent. If you're in the financial services business, you should be a fiduciary, period. Putting yeah. people's interests ahead of yourselves, that should be a given. Yeah. Um, where do you see that headed for the financial advisor space? Do you think they're going to I don't know how you clamp down on that. It's kind of like nailing a jello to the wall, but what's your opinion about this whole fiduciary discussion? Yeah, so I mean, I, so, so I'm a, I've long been in favor of everyone being a fiduciary. I've long been in favor of um, one regulatory uh, environment for advisors. I, I, I used to say, I still say um, is, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't never go to a doctor Right and say, are you acting my best interest or uh, or not? Right or you would never right. go to a point, right. I mean, the, the the notion of fiduciary exists in other professions where it's just a given, right, that they're acting in in your best interest, right. But we have a world in which someone says, I'm wearing this hat and I'm acting in your best interest, but now I'm turning my hat around and I, I'm actually not acting in your best interest now because I'm now you know a product salesman, right. I'm now working as all right a non fiduciary. And, and what's, a con what's a consumer to do in a world where that kind of, you know, bait and switch happens, kind of, right, so to speak? Um, so wouldn't it be nice if the consumer just knew at each and every turn that they were dealing with someone who always put their best interest for us, whether it was an annuity, a life insurance sure. policy, a mutual fund, uh, you know, name the investment or product or account. I'm all for that if they can tell me how they're going to herd those cats. <laughs> and, 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 and get all industries on board to have a compliant nod of the head for that type of regulation. 
I'm all for whatever's best for the consumer, um, yeah. period. I mean, that's the reason I did my direct-to-consumer model for annuities, where you buy the contractual guarantees, you shop all carriers, and really, you know, people always say, well, no one wakes up in the morning to buy an annuity. I say, no, no, they do. I mean, we are the place where annuities are bought, not sold, because we just provide the information, the books, the yeah. videos, and the podcast, things like that. Um, but that's not the case with a lot of annuities. And a lot of annuities that are being sold out there right now, if you took a crash course and passed a test in one week, you all of a sudden can talk to someone about their retirement assets. Yeah. That's, yeah. I never understood that. And I never understood why the life insurance industry fights tooth and nail. I get that. I get their argument from a distribution standpoint, but at some point in time, that's, that's got to get cleaned up. And I think it, it will. I just don't want anything to go bad to force that hand. I think it would be better if they're, they're proactive. Question for you about you know, retirees in general, people either retired already, getting ready to retire, thinking about retirement, planning for retirement. What are the challenges that you see ahead that they might not be seen? What are, what are you, what would you tell someone, you know, that, hey, I'm getting ready to retire in three to five years. What should I be aware of or what should I be thinking of that's not on my radar screen right now? Yeah. So I think, you know, job one is, you know, do you have a handle on what your retirement expenses will be? Do you have a good handle on your sources of retirement income? Will it be Social Security, defined benefit plan? Will there be some uh, earned income? How much from your personal assets, your 401k, your IRA will you be withdrawing? Um, and have you, I'm, I've always been a big fan too of the four box strategy, which was created by Farrell Dolan, uh, sure. formerly with Fidelity. Explain that to people. That, so that's that's the, a good segue. Yeah. The four box strategy was one that says, let's map your guaranteed sources of income with your essential expenses mm -hmm. and let's match your, um, discretionary expenses with your risky assets. And if there's a gap between the two in terms of what you need from, you know, your guaranteed sources don't cover it all. Well, then you're going to have to pull from your, your uh, risky assets and create some sort of guaranteed stream of income. For some, it might be an annuity. For others, maybe they can figure out, I, I know I said don't use the 4% rule, but maybe there's a way to pull from sure. your assets to do that. In essence, what you're saying is have a guaranteed source of income that, that pays for your, your essential expenses and your risky assets paying for your discretionary, whether it's you know trips around the world or trips to Disney World or sure. whatever it might be. And I, and I'll, so that as a first pass, that's a good way to think about, you know, do I, cause what do people worry about? Do I have enough money that will last the rest of my life? Well, if you have guaranteed sources of income that map, map against your essential expenses, you've covered that notion of you have enough money for the rest of your life, regardless of how long it is, right? I mean, none of us knows how long we're going to and live. And you just but. explained annuities. I mean, that if, if the value proposition of a lifetime income annuity, as long as you're breathing, they're going to pay. And I call this, Bob, the income floor. What is your income floor? What is the amount that you need yep. to hit that bank account? And, you know, Social Security, people that say they hate all annuities. Um, by the way, you already own one. It's called Social you're, Security. You own one, right? People, I hate all annuities. Do you have a pension? Yeah, I love that thing. That's an annuity. Yeah. Um, so uh, lifetime income annuities, and you can structure it so that 100% of any unused money goes to your family and the evil annuity company doesn't keep a penny even though they're on the hook yeah. to pay. That's primarily a, a lot of what I do is, is create that income floor. And what I found, Bob, is if people create that income floor, um, then they're better investors because they know that that income is hitting every single month. Yeah. Finish up on the four box. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think, you know, so let me just sort of say if, you know, what people fail to realize is um, when they think about an annuity, they think about it sometimes as an investment, right? And I don't it's think not, of it that way at all, no, right? It's a I contract. Think of it, it's a right? contract. It's a contract, but it's also something else, right? So, you know, if let's say, for example, you've got the four boxes covered, right? You've got all your sources of income covering all your essential and discretionary expenses. The next big thing you need to worry about is let's look at the Society of Actuary lists 15 risks that you'll face in retirement, right? 15 risks. Well, you know, what's your exposure to that risk? What's the probability of that risk happening? What's the consequence of it happening? Is the negative consequence so bad that, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money? So what are the two big risks that people face? One is longevity risk, right? The right. risk of outliving your money. So I look at an annuity um, as insurance against the risk of outliving your asset, right? And if people sort of look at it that way, and say, oh, right, I've got Social Security, I've got a defined benefit, those are annuities, and now I've purchased an annuity. 
Now, people, as you know, right, say, oh, I don't want an annuity because I, I give up loss of, right, I give up the loss of my money or, right. And that's I, true. You, know, you lose opportunity. And with some types, you lose control over the asset in, in exchange for that lifetime income. There are some types that, that can still provide the lifetime income. But you are right with, with full control of the asset. But you're right. Some of the fears that's been laid down by bad advertising, misleading advertising, and, and truly um, advisors not understanding the annuity world, because I believe you would agree with me. When we're at Dean Witter a long time ago, there wasn't a lot of talk about annuities. Um, you know, it's just started because there's such a, a tidal wave of baby boomers hitting 65. Um, every single day, and they're looking for guarantees. I always mm -hmm. people say, "Well, how's business?" Fantastic, because I'm in front of a demographic tidal wave, and we're selling contractual guarantees. Um, the only thing that annuities can't solve for, regardless of the sales pitch you heard at the Bad Chicken Dinner seminar, they cannot solve for inflation. If you put any type of increase to that payment, the annuity company have the big buildings for a reason. They don't give that away. They're just going to lower the payment. So I always tell people. If and when inflation hits, then you do a reverse engineered quote. You can run them at my site if you want to at theannuityman.com to solve for that specific dollar amount. But dovetailing into that and finish up on the four box, and then I want you to kind of dig in more about inflation. Yeah. So, so one of the things, you know, if, if you think about covering your essential expenses with these guaranteed sources, mm -hmm. well, then, you know, you're looking at your risky assets as funding or not funding your discretionary. So maybe you planned a trip, maybe COVID happened. Now you've got more assets in your risky bus bucket to cover discretionary expenses. And that, that amount's going to fluctuate, right? You don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to spend it all in that mm -hmm. one year, but it's there when you need it. The, the other thing that's interesting too is sort of spending patterns over the course of retirement. So one of the things that we know is that over the three phases of retirement, go, go, slow, go, no, go, your spending will decline mm -hmm. and the components of your spending will, ch will change, right? So maybe in the go, go years, you're spending more on travel and in the slow, go, you're spending more on healthcare. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so maybe at some point you're going to be pulling more from your discretionary into your guaranteed sources to cover those essential expenses like healthcare expenses, you know, which become roughly like 15% of your expenditures by the time you're 85 or so. Sure. And that's because, right, healthcare expenses are rising faster than ordinary expenses, but you're also spending more on healthcare as well as you age, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 you're right you're about these, so the, of the 15 risks, the two I worry most about is uh, longevity and inflation. So if you cover um, in longevity with an annuity, well, what would you, what's the, how do you cover inflation? And the only thing that you can cover it with really right, are risky assets, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a, a, a balance fund, or maybe it's a, you know, pre predominantly stock fund, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But, but you know, that's the asset that, that covers inflation. And, uh, and truth be told, right, risky assets don't cover longevity, right? There's no guarantee that those that's assets right. will be there at the end of someone's lifetime, you know, given the market volatility. But there is a guarantee that the annuity will pay you regardless of what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to think about, OK, how do I cover all these risks? And, you know, what are the tools in the toolbox and not and not eliminate the tool because you think, oh, I don't like this or I don't like that. No, the tool is right. I, I have a I have a nail and I'm not banging it with a screwdriver. I'm banging it with a hammer. So I think people need to think about those risks and what's the appropriate tool to use to manage and mitigate that risk. And, and so if you do those two things, right, got my income and expenses covered I, mm -hmm. and I've got my risk covered, you know, you're 80% of the way there. After that, you say, okay, how do I allocate my assets, right? So what's, you know, what's in the floor? Uh, what's in the upside bucket? Which accounts mm -hmm. do I have? Do I have a Roth IRA? Do I have a traditional IRA? Do I have a 401k that needs to be converted into a, an IRA? Um, what about my home, right? I mean, we haven't talked about this yet, but when we think about creating cash flow in retirement, if, if your second largest or first largest asset is the equity in your home, well, how are you going to tap that if you need it? A lot of, right, a lot of people use it as their break glass asset, right? If I need to go in a nursing home, I have the equity in my home. But I know a lot of people that have been using reverse mortgages sure. um, instead of like, you know, to, to sort of mitigate the risk of sequence of return risk. Right, where they're pulling money from their home using a reverse mortgage to cover money that they would have pulled from their risky asset portfolio when it's down in value. And yeah, and, so. and that, in that scenario, reverse mortgages do work. In fact, I got a question the other day from someone and, and they kind of fit in that, that uh, parameter of it was one of their largest assets. Their spouse had died. 
they didn't have any ki- he didn't have any kids and i'm like well you know i mean that makes sense for you to maybe look at a reverse mortgage but certainly it's a by the way for all you listeners and viewers out there it's illegal to use reverse mortgage proceeds to buy any type of annuity so don't <laughs> allow someone to do that or if they do it send them to jail because that is that is big time illegal um so what do you think about markets here? I mean, we're at all time highs. I mean, it seems like it's, it's never ending. Um, we've been through the never endings before, but it's got a different feel because it doesn't look like rates are going up anytime soon. And so where do you put your money and you put it in the markets and it's, it's dart throwing days. We're back to throwing darts at this thing and everything working. Does that make you feel as queasy as it makes me feel? I'm extremely queasy, right? I mean, for years we told people, right, 60, 40 portfolio, 60, 30, 10, whatever it is. Um, What we've witnessed now is, right, companies like JP Morgan and BlackRock, they've come up with capital market expectations that are just historically half of what they used to be. So where do you put, right? So so markets are high. Yeah. Um, Expected return is low. Yields are low. (laughs) And right. we print, and we printed seven trillion and counting. Right. So we've never seen that before. And there's no tick data looking back to say what's the last time we printed. I guess you could go back to World War II. I heard a good analogy the other day that the last time we printed money like this was during World War II. Yeah. Um, to to make up, or it might have been World War One, but I think it was World War II to make to to create some flow. And I guess they they're thinking that uh, COVID, and I guess there's an argument for it that. It was another war. Yeah. So, but what do you think about all the printing? I mean, well, it's it's you know it's it's dangerous in the sense that right it's it's now we have too much money chasing too few things, and so obviously right. it it creates this you know uh, you know if you don't invest you're going to be left behind. Now, I, so I, I would say you know maybe the thing that would drive me in my decision making here would be what's my time horizon. Right. Um, you know, if I'm, you know, my daughter just graduated college. She has 40 years to go, right, before she retires. Um, I, I'd say to her, you know, bet the ranch, right? It's okay if you're in the market. It's going to go up 20, down 30. It's going to go up, down 15, up 40, right, over the course of your lifetime. And maybe on average, it's 10 to 12 percent, or maybe it's seven and a half, whatever it is. But you can suffer the ups and downs, right? Sure. If you're on retirement's doorstep and you know that you've got, well, you've got maybe 30 years of retirement, but you know, this is the money that you have to fund your living expenses. And I think maybe you have to start de-risking a little bit, right? And yes, you won't get a high return on, on money market funds or CDs. Um, but what choice do you have, right? I mean, you're sort of betwixt between this notion of I could lose 20%, but I need that money, right? right. Or I can, you know, lose negative uh, 1% real return, but at least I have some money to, you know, to pay for my bills. So I think that's sort of what I would look at. What's your time horizon and how much risk you need to take off the table? You know, Stan, there's one other thing I'll tell you. You asked me like what retirees need to do. And then and it's probably the sure. most important thing besides getting the money right. Mm-hmm. I, I always say that people, um, oftentimes they retire from something, but not to something. Nice. So I'd say before you pull the trigger, do a deep dive into what, how are you going to spend your day when you're tired? Most people I talk to say, you know, I thought golf would be fun five days a week. <laughs> But, but it's not. My back hurts, right? <laughs> My back hurts. And, you know, now it's like a job instead of instead of a diversion, right? So I'd say, you know, think really long and hard. I mentioned Farrell Dolan a little bit ago. He told sure. me before he retired, he thought about his life in four quadrants. It was, he was going to do community work. He was going right. to do a little gardening. He was going to do a little traveling and spend a little time with his grandkids. He had it all mapped out. And so I think, you know, most people need to map it out and say, you know, I, maybe I don't have all 30 years of my retirement mapped out. Maybe I don't have every single day mapped out, but generally I'm going to do this. I'm going to, as I'm doing, right? I'm volunteering for community organizations. I'm not yet retired, but I'm sort of like playing retirement, right? I'm seeing what it would be like to volunteer and help and be part of the community. Um, maybe it is it is spending more time with grandkids. I, I have an old college roommate. He's got 10 grandkids. He spends his, uh, his weekends traveling to Oklahoma or Florida sure. or, you know, name the city and be with his grandkids. Um, but really think long and hard, you know, maybe some, maybe you want to go, uh, spend your days at the library. I don't know. Think long and hard about it because you'll become bored really fast if you don't have something to do. I tell people all the time, Bob, you might want to steal this because this is the, you're from Swamp Scott, Massachusetts. I'm from Stanley, North Carolina, rural North Carolina. Our saying is there's no U-Hauls behind hearses. <laughs> <laughs> and if you see a picture of that, send it to me, but you can't take it with you. So you, you do have to 
you know, live for the day. Uh, again, retirementdaily.net, retirementdaily, all one word, .net is how you get to Bob Powell, who, if you haven't heard of him, you, I know you've read his articles when you've looked through USA Today, you just didn't look at the picture, okay? But you've read his stuff, but he needs to be on your, your constant read. So go to retirementdaily.net and just check him out. You know, he's all over the place. But I wanted to, last question I really wanted to ask and get your opinion on, and it really revolves around the financial journalism space. Yeah. Because we both have seen, I mean, we've seen it really morph and change for, some would argue, not, it's not as good as it once was because it's just a little bit more muddied. And people like you um, it should be put on a pedestal. And, it's, and sometimes there's just so much noise out there that, that, and that's part of the reason I have you on. I want my my people to know who you are. This is a guy that I filter, that I know that sh you should be reading. But what's happening in the financial journalism space and where do you see it headed? So it reminds me a little bit, I guess, of when the Gutenberg Press came into existence, right? We, we saw the, <laughs> the marketization of information. And, and, uh, and, and what happens then is, is uh, it creates a, a, you know, many voices. And it's really hard to filter the good from the bad out there. And I think, uh, and I think that's a, a challenge, right? I mean, if if you were fond of going to websites or Reddit or you know, I don't know, YouTube, TikTok, I mean, you'll sure. find many people giving you financial advice that probably don't have the qualifications to do so, sure. and you may not have the ability to, you know, vet the good from the bad. And uh, and so I would say, for the moment, if if what you do is stick to trusted news sources, you know. Wall Street Journal, USA Today. Mm -hmm. um, the good news about places like that is they still have editors who are vetting the content that's being written by um, the people writing for them. That's a good point. Doesn't make and them perfect, but at least they have that filter in place. They have something in place that's not just you know direct to consumer. And that's not to say there aren't many good people out there writing direct to consumer who don't have editors. Sure. But but as a as you as the reader of this information, you have no idea what their credentials are, and you have no idea whether you know, I always like to say, you know, do right by the reader, right? Don't make them go read, go elsewhere for the rest of the story. And, and, and that, and, and, uh, you know, that's my criteria, right? But I don't know if that's the guy that's writing on his own blog, whether that's the same criteria or whether he's selling something or whether, he, whether he's getting money from his sponsors to say something, right? I mean, it's really hard to know what's credible and what's not. So I'd say stick to credible news sources and, you know, and then maybe, you know, read read that stuff but but then you know what's that old saying in journalism you know if your mother says that she loves you double check it right so you know or what <laughs> or your, how about your wife can we say why um that, that, that <laughs> yeah. that's or, that's you know, funny what, what did ronald reagan used to say trust but verify and i think no, that's i agree of, right I, trust but for verify. me for me i like um reading people like you that have been in it decades and that has seen market cycles. You've seen things go down. You've seen the dot coms. You've seen you've seen introductions of industries like internet. You've been around so long that even though it's new, it's kind of nothing new. Kind of getting back to the whole crypto thing. And you know, for people that want to do their research, pull up Tulip Bulb. Just type in Tulip Bulb Financial, and you'll read a long time ago in the Netherlands, I believe. Tulip bulbs were going for thousands and thousands of dollars. You're saying, wait a minute, Stan, what? Tulip yeah. bulbs? Yes. And I'm not correlating tulip bulbs to crypto by any stretch of the imagination. But what I am saying is when you have this fever and this, this hype and this craze and everyone wants to get on it and wants to get on the train, that's when the train tip eventually, yeah. it might not this time, but eventually runs off the track and people get hurt. So Stan, I'll, I'll leave you with one last thought, right? Because you just sort of triggered something in my Good. brain, which is, That's my which job. is um, you know, people need to become more cognizant of their behavioral biases, right? So right now we all have them. We all think we're rational, but we're not. And, you know, this notion of Bitcoin and crypto and, and, uh, and SPACs and yeah. NFTs, you know, yeah. everyone's falling victim to recency bias, right? They think that what can happen yesterday is going to continue tomorrow. Nice. And if they were just aware of recency bias, right, or or overconfidence bias, or any of the biases that might affect you, 
maybe you would put the brakes on what you're doing. So I'd say, you know, if, if there's nothing else that you do from the result of listening to us talk today, it's go check out, you know, a primer on behavioral biases. I just wrote a column about this for Market Watch, and nice. so it's top of mind. And it was fascinating because, you know, there's, there's so many biases out there. And if you just had a, an inkling of, your, of whether you're prone to these biases, it just might stop you from doing the wrong thing. That's phenomenal. I mean, we all have political bias and confirmation bias. We know what that is. And we, recency bias, really, that's, that's a neat phrase. As the kids put it, it's FOMO, fear <laughs> of missing out. Right. And I think a lot of the, the craziness that we're seeing from an investor standpoint is that FOMO. You, you see all the articles about things you don't understand. And by the way, Bob just threw in NFTs. And if you don't know what that is, that's called a non-fungible token. And it's a digital collectible, for, le for lack of a better phrase, and there's billions of dollars being purchased in non-fungible tokens. So if you really want to do some fun research, type that in and go down that rabbit hole because you really have to dial yourself in to figure it out. But once you figure out, it is fascinating. I think we're living in phenomenal times, Bob, that you know, there's some really new stuff um, coming out of, the, of COVID that I'm not saying COVID created it, but you know, we were all locked in for so long that we're yeah. now coming out and it's just kind of a new world, especially in the investment side. But anytime there's the new world, you gotta be careful because the grifters show up and the sociopaths show up. Yeah, the Ponzi I mean, scheme we're people show up. The, right, we're watching that with ESG right now and, and yes. the notion of greenwashing, right? As people say, oh, my fund is uh, climate change friendly. And you know, next thing you know, it's really just that in name only. So yeah, it's yeah. an exciting time, but it's also a dangerous time. In <laughs> any closing words before we leave our friends on the Fun with Annuities YouTube podcast? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, if, if you're going to become an investor, if you're serious about saving for retirement, investing for retirement, you know, become a student of the subject. Um, really do deep dives. Yeah. You know, the, the, the things, Social Security claiming is uh, really complicated. Medicare is complicated. Um, RMDs are, you know, IR, the rules regarding IRAs are complicated. Sure. Mistakes are costly. So just don't, you know, think about, you know, <laughs> People always say this, right? They'll probably spend 10,000 hours planning a trip to the Teton, mm -hmm. right? The Grand Tetons or Yellowstone. Um, you should spend just as much time thinking about your, your money, your retirement accounts, your investments. And to put that in Southern speak, there's no mulligans in retirement. Um, you only get one chance. You only get one shot at it. You can't put the, the ball back on the tee. Bob Powell, obviously, it is a pleasure for you to join us. We're honored that you're here. We hope to have you back in the future as things unwind and unfold. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Once again, to reach, uh, to read Bob, and, and if you want to email him, his, his contact information is on the, on the site, retirementdaily.net, retirementdaily.net. That is Bob Powell, who is a monster when it comes to content and good content in the financial space. Bob, thanks for joining us. And thanks everyone for joining me, your host, Stan the Annuity Man, America's annuity agent on the number one annuity podcast on the planet. And it just happens to be called Fun with Annuities. Thanks for listening to Fun with Annuities. Please hit the subscribe button and make sure to go to my site at theannuityman.com where you can run your own SPIA, DIA, and QLAC quotes and see a live feed of the best MIGA fix rates in the country and even get indexed and income rider quotes as well. You can also sign up for my six annuity owner's manual books and I'll ship them for free and under no obligation. I also encourage you to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me, Stan the Annuity Man, so we can have a full discussion of your specific situation. It will be the best brutally factual and truthful advice you will ever get and that's one guarantee you should definitely take advantage of so join me next time for the number one annuity podcast on the planet fun with annuities